Thank you. I can see that some people didn't like my presentation. They already cut off a bit of it. Uh, I'm going to repeat just a little bit what Brian and Randy spoke about in talking about uh, healthy communities. And um, Mount Pearl is indeed an extremely active community. And I'm not pushing the button. Is somebody down there? It has a mind of its own. Uh, just a, a com I can't help but comment on at East Coast Trail. Uh, what a volunteer group has done for this province is totally amazing. And when you consider that we have the number one coastline in the world, that totally blows my mind. And in my opinion, we have one of the number one uh, hiking trails in the world that goes along it. A note of caution. And cheers for that. I will, I will give one note of caution, that when you drive down the southern shore now, who are, are experiencing development pressure, much like many communities on the Northeast Avalon are, you'll start to see the impact of land development pressure and the impact on the beautiful coastline that, we're, that is starting to take place that we need to be cognizant of. And what I'm going to talk to you about here today, I think, is a model that can support maintaining uh, that beautiful coastline and a very high quality of life. I am, uh, like Mr. Young, I'm going to be flying up here and I'm dealing a little bit with what I call the drudgery of planning. But uh, with the old adage that a word is worth a thousand pictures, I have no pictures in my presentation, so you're just going to have to listen to me. Uh, but if you want to go to our website, uh, trackconsulting.com, and regrettably I have to depart this afternoon, but my very able uh, Bailey Kunz, if you wouldn't mind standing up, Bailey, is with Tract. If you have any further questions or might want to talk to Tract, uh, we're certainly available. So to begin, I'm at the East Coast Trail. <laughs> oh, I pushed the wrong side, sorry. So I'm going to proceed at pace. I'm going to deal with, I'm really going at pace. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Maybe you could push the button for me. That would be brilliant. So I'm going to talk about three things. It's good to animate when you're messing up. I'm going to talk about the context, division, and moving forward. Next slide, please. So, you must do some kind of transition in your presentation that's fast enough. Yeah, that's Okay, that, that's, sorry about that, folks, because I spent uh, 15, 20 minutes getting this ready. <laughs> you just go back one? Now go ahead one. Okay, here we are. Hold it there. Press the pause button. So I'm, in terms of the context that we're going to, uh, from a sustainable planning context, we need to look at the model that we plan from, which will be the next slide. And so we need to talk about sustainable development on the top. And sustainable development really, from my perspective, talks about how we manage our land base. And properly planned land base can have a positive impact and the social, economic, and environmental uh, use and enjoyment of our community. When we look at the bottom and we talk about healthy communities, keep in mind that healthy communities can be defined in many different ways. Generally, we think about healthy in terms of getting out, being active, but we all also need to think about healthy from a mental perspective. I spent uh, 12, 13 years working on building the Grand Concourse, and in our surveys, we found that almost as many people were walking for mental relief as they were for physical activity and feeling good. So don't underestimate uh, the benefit of trails for mental relief to get away from everything. And it is said, of course, that we need to make contact and have exposure to nature. Again, sustainable planning allows us to do that. And healthy as well might mean a new young family being able to afford a house. It might mean being able to, as Mr. Young alluded to, being able to leave your home and walk to the corner store versus having to get in a car to go to get that bag of milk. Sustainable planning also means a better environment, an enhanced environmental quality, because we've incorporated the environment on the front end into how we plan our communities, not on the back end. And it also means a better quality of life. It might mean that uh, seniors have places to go uh, to recreate and be engaged with one another. It might mean that mothers have a safe and comfortable place to take their children for a walk. 
So in terms of the context we're talking about, in Newfoundland, we've got over 250 different communities that have a variety and distinct health-related challenges. Now, we like to consider ourselves, many of us, as unique. What we need to consider is all communities might not be unique, but they all are distinct, and all communities should be evaluated and assessed from a planning perspective based on the characteristics of that individual community. Planning should not be cookie-cutter. It needs to be specific to the community that we're living in. Sustainable planning, then, integrates the idea of healthy communities in the planning process. Uh, sustainable planning and healthy communities really are joined at the hip, and I think that when you plan sustainably, you also plan to support the healthy community model. Traditional planning approach, generally, we've looked at economic development as the planning model. What is the uh, increase on the tax base we can get by putting in, say, a housing development or commercial development? Sustainable planning looks at integrating the triad of social, ecological, and uh, economic in our model. So what we need to do at the end of the planning process is we should be able to prioritize what we're going to do on an annual basis. Here is priority one, priority two, priority three. There was an analysis done through municipal affairs uh, two years ago where they looked at most of municipal plans in the province, and what they found is there's a sameness to all the plans. The plans, again, need to be distinct to your community, and they need to end with saying, here is what you need to do to attain the sustainable planning, sustainable model for your community. Next, please. So what's the vision? So what is sustainable planning? It's, again, taking a comprehensive, integrative, and inclusive approach. The planning needs have to be community-specific. Identify and understand your community and what your needs are. You need to look at planning from a long-range perspective, not short-term. Uh, the city of Calgary has a 100-year planning vision for its community. That's how we need to think but in a five-year framework, we know need to identify here's what we're going to do. Uh, here's what we're going to do each year. So the planning begins with visioning, guiding principles, development, objectives, and actions. We need to balance the environment, social, with the cultural aspects. And the goal is to what's called a complete or a healthy community. And a complete and healthy community is a place where we live. It's a place where we work. It's a place where we recreate. It's a place where we shop. And more and more, it's a place where we grow food. Remember years ago, everybody in Newfoundland had a garden? That's, that's welling up and really starting to happen again, and it's a good thing. So how's it done? Critical that you understand the community demographic and the current health. Uh, Mr. Young gave a number of si slides uh, that talked about the inactivity, uh, that, hey, we're, we're number one in Canada, and we need to deal with that. You need to look at your demographic profile and project 10 years on what is the makeup of your community going to be and plan for that makeup. So everything we design and build needs to be what we call multifunctional. So as the demographic of your community changes, so too can the infrastructure that you're spending your precious capital dollars on developing. It's also really important to understand what is valued by the community. And we suggest in the at the first stages of the planning process, we should map what's important to the community and what the community wants to preserve. Generally, we take the opposite approach. But if you look at what we have in most of our communities already, you can readily map it. We have riparian zone legislation in this province that is uh, the envy of most provinces in Canada. If we didn't have the riparian zone legislation, you wouldn't have the Grand Concourse, you wouldn't have the... Uh, Cornerbrook Stream Trail, for example. That provides for a public right-of-way along all water bodies and all ponds in this province. And it's brilliant, and we need to use it. But look at communities that are not and are allowing development that goes right to the water's edge. Trails, in association with development, enhances the sellability of the homes and increases the equity in those homes. That's just from the financial perspective. So what we need to do then is identify the land that is left over and use that land and focus on our development. Next, please. I think we got it going pretty good now. <laughs> so how's it done? First of all, we need to create compact residential patterns. Now, someone says, gee whiz, do we really want compact residential patterns? 
Well, you know, we've been creating compact residential patterns in Newfoundland for years. Walk downtown St. John's. Walk through Port of Basque. Walk through many of the rural communities in this island, and we're cheek by jowl. Fair enough, and we should be. But there's a tremendous sense of place, there's a tremendous sense of character, and there's a tremendous ability to interact. And also, there's great densification. So it provides opportunities for other things, such as that quart of milk that you can buy down on the corner, or linking in trail systems, et cetera, et cetera. Focus on community design. Sometimes I think in Newfoundland, we have an aversion to design. And I think in development, we hate trees. <laughs> How many communities are looking at opportunities for parkland acquisition, where you can link up the system? I'm not even talking about land ownership in this province. It is a huge problem. We have not found, we know of one municipality that has mapped and identified who owns what in their community. If you cannot identify and map the lands in your community, how do you plan? We don't have to register our land in Newfoundland, and it makes it really difficult to plan. Communities need a land base that identifies who owns what so you can plan for it. But again, I digress. So we need to identify the lands that you need to acquire to integrate the system. When we did the plan for Mount Pearl that Brian referred to, we identified open spaces that they should divest of and use that money to buy lands to make an interconnected system. And it works, and it can be done. The other thing that's very important is affordable housing is a huge issue in this province, and we need to take it seriously. We worked on the, uh, the Canada Lands Project, 64 acres redevelopment in uh, Pleasantville for Canada Lands Company. It is based on these principles. The very first project that went in there was affordable housing. We need to pursue active and healthy living initiatives, and there are tons of them out there, and most of all, and critical, and sometimes we're afraid of this, and I don't know why, we need to engage the community. I can give you an example of a project where they were trying to get it approved for eight years, and the reason it wasn't approved is the public wasn't engaged in the process. It took us 10 months. Next, please. So what are the benefits? Enhanced design, function, prosperity, and livable, healthy communities. It provides long-term economic sta st stability opportunities, as Mr. Young referred to in his presentation. People that are looking for a community to live in, people that are looking for businesses that are looking for a community to relocate in, that aspects of sustainable planning, healthy communities is what they are looking for. I talked to a mayor last night, believe it or not, who had lost a medical doctor in his community to another community because they didn't have a gymnastics program in that town. Continue growth and enhanced visual environmental quality. Why do we perpetuate ugliness? <laughs> I, I don't know why. We, we need to create beauty, and we need to create beauty by integrated design. And it's, it's readily done, and there are lots of places that are doing it. But it seems as we introduce, as we introduce development, we, we, I live in CBS. And one time people would come to CBS because it was beautiful. And it still is in many ways. But it's develop, 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 develop. Without the consideration for that inter interconnectivity, for our consideration for creating beauty. And I'm not pulling on CBS. They have significant challenges in how to manage it, which goes right back to our Urban and Rural Planning Act that, again, I won't get into. And we need, as, as well, to strengthen our regional capacity and cooperation. We need to work together. And there's lots of good examples of this that are starting to happen, and organizations like the Harris Center are starting to push it. Next, please. So sustainable planning minimizes our use of resources and energy because of that compaction. It creates a sense of place and pride. We do community branding exercises that we've seen actually elevate, elevate the community. Uh, we branded Torbay as beautiful Torbay, and they've adopted that, and man, have they taken off with that. And it's great stuff. We need to respond to local development challenges. We need to work with our local development community. Basically, what the development community wants to know is what's the rules of the ball game for development in your community. We need to have coordinated future growth patterns and stop this leapfrogging that's going to be very difficult for municipalities to maintain over time. And we need, most of all, to improve the quality of life for local residents. 
So how do we move forward and what are the current opportunities? I'm going to deal with four things. Planning. Individual community health and sustainability. These plans need to be specific to the community, who you are, where you're going, what your vision is, and what your demographic, what your community framework looks like. We need to identify sustainability targets and checklists. It might be, I'll give you an example. When I started working with Mr. Paul Johnson, uh, a fantastic philanthropist who put zillions of dollars into the Grand Concourse, his plan was this big. And we were having trouble getting people to understand what he wanted to do because it was so big. And he, in his wisdom, and he's very wise, suggested, why don't we do a couple of demonstration projects? And that's what we did. We, did, we developed a couple of walks up to Signal Hill. We did some work at the university campus. And people started to see, okay, now I can see what you're... And we never looked back. Thirteen years later, we got, I think, what's, what's been recognized internationally as one of the greatest walkway systems everywhere, anywhere uh, put in place. And I got two minutes. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> So we need to identify what are our priorities for development and what's the ongoing, how do we mo uh, monitor and ensure compliance? Because there's no good having regulations in place if nobody's going to comply with them. So we need to identify that planning framework, consider parks, open space, and recreation master plans. They have tremendous power if they're done properly. They should be based on real need, not perceived need. And I could talk a lot on recreation planning and suggest what the physical works and programs should be, and Brian related some of that. Community design, create beauty in our, in our communities. Make your community beautiful. It can be done. We need integrated, multidisciplinary design teams. We set up track. We have an engineer on staff now, and we're tickled. We finally got one. We've got an architect, we're landscape architects, we're planners, we're urban designers, we're an integrated team because that's the approach that's needed as we move forward. We need to plan, program, design, build, manage, maintain, and monitor. We tend to focus on the building. We need to do upfront planning before we build it. We need a well-designed community that equals a healthy community. And our mantra for our work is we say every resident should be within a 10-minute walk of a park or an open space. If we want to have people active, well, we need to provide the opportunities in our communities for them to be active. And we need to design for seniors and youth. If you take care of the very young and the very old, the middle tends to fill itself in, as you're seeing. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, so really important to have an integrated system of parks and trails to link all new developments into the system. And what we find sometimes is a trail system gets built, but we don't have the means in place in our regulations to have new developments properly integrated into that system. We need to support densification, ad advanced street network planning. Man, we could talk a lot about that, but we're not doing it. I'm not sure why. View plan management, biodiversity, vegetative retention. We don't require vegetation retention plans for our land development projects. Design public gathering spaces. Every community should have a number of those. And a town center that's linked to all of it. And partner with schools and create community centers. Why there's not better partnering with schools and recreation programming, I don't know. There's some great examples out there that are working. More needs to be done. Next, please. In terms of governance, focus on regional initiatives and cooperation. Engage the community formally in everything you do. It's a good thing to do, and it will get you forward faster, and it actually saves you money, again, as Mr. Young alluded to. Use town halls and social media to communicate. If you want to commu communicate with the youth, you better learn to tweet. <laughs> Volunteers are key and are critical to success. Uh, seek the support of NGOs. Uh, East Coast Trail is a tremendous example of what an NGO can do for you. And develop community incentive programs. Next, please. Capacity. Uh, dedicate human and financial resources to do this. Develop a community communication and branding strategy. Start small and build from your successes, those demonstration projects I talk about, and focus on regional initiatives, cooperation, partnership, and resource sharing to make sure that you get the bang for those capital bucks. So next steps, incentive programs can be offered. Uh, Mr. Young referred to a handbook. Why can't we have a handbook on sustainable, healthy communities? Why can't we have province-wide workshops to talk to communities about this stuff and how it can happen? And maybe we should have draft sustainable plans and regulations to help communities plan. Next, please. 
In summation, sustainable and healthy communities is more than a concept. It's real, and it's happening globally. It requires a new way of thinking about our communities that looks at that triad I talked about, and it requires provincial community commitment and local support, and it requires a new community land use planning framework needs to emerge that looks at the environment, looks at social aspects of your community, and looks at the economic aspects. And finally, I add to my model on the bottom to implement this, you need proper policy and planning, you need that community design I talked about, you need a governance model, and you need enhanced capacity if it's going to work. So thank you very much, and apologies for the slideshow.